Hi, I'm Pastor Matt from the New Life Church in Oshawa. I want to encourage you to visit our YouTube channel and to like our videos and to subscribe. You will surely be blessed by our content, including today's message. Today I want to turn your attention to a familiar story when Jesus turned the water into wine. When Jesus turned the water into wine, we find it in John chapter 2. John chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. We're going to start with verses 1 to 3, and then as we study God's Word together, we will get to the rest of the story. John chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. And on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited, invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. I want to speak to you today from the subject entitled DW. DW. Let us pray. Lord, we empty ourselves today and we pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. Teach us from your Holy Word and make us, Lord, your holy vessels to be a blessing in this world. Speak now, Lord, your word of truth, your wonderful words of truth, and grant that your word will go forth and not return unto you void, for we ask it in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. Many of us, if not most of us, use some sort of slang from time to time. We do it in person. We even do it online. There are so many slang terms used in cyberspace that it's hard to keep track of. If you've ever been on TikTok or Twitter, you likely came across a phrase or two you were unfamiliar with. For instance, ICYMI stands for, in case you missed it. It can be used in many ways, and is often accompanied by information such as an article or video that you believe the recipient would appreciate or find interesting. Here's an example of ICYMI in use. ICYMI, the warriors traded for Chris Paul. Someone said, I guess nobody said amen. <laughs> then there is the word riz. Riz is a slang term often used to describe someone's ability to flirt and be charming, especially with their verbal communication, while pursuing a romantic interest. The term can be used as a noun or a verb depending on the sentence. If you want to riz someone, it means you want to flirt with or charm them. If you want to riz someone. Riz is derived from the word charisma. <laughs> yeah, now you know. If you don't know, now you know. It's derived from the word charisma and as an especial magnetic charm or appeal. Here's an example of how to use riz. Joe just tries to riz up Jen. But I don't think it went too well. Joe was struggling, I guess. I feel sorry for Joe because Joe just tried to riz up Jen. Then there's no cap. No cap means no lie, but you already knew that, right? No lie. Cap, on the other hand, means lie. So no cap emphasizes when someone is being truthful. If someone is capping... They're lying. Like when I told Aiden when he was a little child that I used to play in the NHL, I was capping. <laughs> Here's an example of how to use no cap. Someone says, you can't be serious right now, 
and the other person says, I really am, no cap. Then there is my favorite, DW. DW stands for don't worry, don't worry. It is often used in text messaging to tell someone there is no need to stress. The situation is all good and under control. The slang term reassures the other person that they can relax because everything is okay. Here are some examples of how to use DW. I just arrived, DW, see you in a bit. I'm so stressed about the test tomorrow, and in response, the message comes, DW, you got this. I feel like my life is spinning out of control. DW, God's got this. The passage we are looking at today is a passage that screams DW. Now, I don't know about you, but I've come to notice that in life there is so much that we can be worried about and so much to be stressed about. Can I get a witness in the house today? Is anyone at church today as a pastor by himself in the pulpit? In life, there is so much to be worried about and so much to be stressed about. Sometimes we are facing opposition, resistance, rejection. Sometimes we are facing endless problems and expectations. Sometimes we feel inadequate in this life, and that's exactly what this story is about. The experience of inadequacy is found in John chapter 2, and it helps us to see that Jesus is adequate even in the most inadequate situations. Jesus, in essence, responds to the situation by saying, D.W., The story takes place at the beginning, at the beginning, right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, before crowds, rumors, and threats followed him everywhere. Rachel Held Evans describes the scene in John chapter 2 this way. Jesus attended a wedding at Cana. It was just the sort of event the man was known to love, packed with eating and drinking, music and laughter, The scent of roasted lamb mingled with the perfume of flower garlands. The sweet taste of pomegranate, raisins, dates, and honey. The roar of animated conversations between family and friends punctuated by the music of bangles clinking around the women's wrists. It's a beautiful scene. It's a wedding. A scene of joy which quickly turns to a scene of stress and panic. It all started with an invitation, verse 2. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. John describes the invitation. When the bride and groom were putting the guest list together, Jesus' name was included on the guest list. It tells us that if we want to experience God's power, we must first invite Jesus into our lives. Jesus was invited to the wedding at Cana. Jesus shows up to the barbecues and the weddings and the parties and the festivals. If Jesus had not been invited to that wedding, the miracle would not have taken place. We must invite Jesus into every area of our lives. We come to church, and we worship God, and then we leave God at church. But I stop by here to say, take God with you to the grocery store. Take him to work with you. Take him to the party. Take him to the barbecue. We must seek his blessings and his guidance in every aspect of our experience. I mean, it tells us that Jesus is not too holy to go to a jam. I mean, not too holy to go to a wedding or a celebration. Most importantly, it tells us that that God cares about every single detail of our lives. 
Upon Jesus' shoulder rested the work of redemption and salvation, and yet he took time to walk nine miles from Nazareth to Cana to go to a wedding. What a God we serve. Jesus could have performed his first miracle from the top of the temple in Jerusalem. Everyone would have seen it on YouTube, but instead he chose to do it in a secret at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Cana was a poor place just like Nazareth where Jesus was from. A poor place. Jesus took time to be in a poor place at a wedding. And Cana was a poor place, but maybe not as frowned upon as Nathaniel would lead us to believe in John chapter 1 when he frowned upon Nazareth. Nevertheless, don't be fooled. Cana was of little reputation. And yet Jesus performed the first miracle of his ministry there. He does so on the third day. On the third day. This is mentioned on purpose and with purpose. Jesus died on Friday, and he rose on the third day, Sunday. It reminds us today, no matter what you're going through, that God is able to resurrect us from the most impossible and dead situations. D.W., there's a third day coming for each and every one of us. D.W., there's hope for the future. D.W., Hosea 6 and verse 2, it says, After two days, he will revive us, and on the third day, he will restore us, that we may live in his presence. D.W., you're going through that situation on July the 8th, 2023. But D.W., you will resist the temptation. D.W., you will achieve the impossible. After the invitation, John describes the inquiry. Verse 3, and when they ran, when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. A wedding in those times was not like a Western world wedding today. Maybe you're going to many weddings in this season called summer. And you go to the wedding and you go to the church and you go to the reception and you wait for the bridal party to show up and you eat your food and you do a little dance. You just make sure no one from church is watching. <laughs> yes. And you go home. A wedding in those days consisted of three or four days of feasting, sometimes up to a week of feasting. So it was a lot of work and expense to keep the guests happy with food and drink. Just like life. Anybody know what the pastor's talking about? Sometimes it's a lot of work to keep people happy and satisfied. It's a lot of effort. It's a lot of expense to take care of those children. And sometimes we run out. But running out is embarrassing. Running out of drink, running out of food, running out of money, running out of gas, running out of patience, running out of energy, running out of ideas, running behind running late. That's why I'm not running in the pastor's race at track and field, because I don't want to run out or be run past. I want you to realize that it's not just a matter of running out of wine. When they ran out of wine, the hosts were facing serious social embarrassment. It was the groom's family who provided the wedding feast. And to run out of food or beverage at the wedding was considered shameful, calling into question the groom's ability to provide for his wife and his family in the future. Wine in those times was not a luxury at the LCBO. Water was scarce and sometimes contaminated, making wine necessary for cooking. 
Wine was not only a staple like rice and bread and milk. It was a signal of God's blessing on your community. And yet it's interesting to me that they wait until they're completely void of wine before they seek for help. Maybe that's a glimpse of the Cana people. Not only are they critical like Nathaniel and struggling with self-awareness, but they struggle with self-sufficiency. They waited till there was nothing left before they asked for help. Fact is, sometimes God has to let you run out in life so that you run to him in life. The Cain a couple ran out of wine, just like Judaism in Jesus' day. Don't miss the big picture. It was self-sufficient and self-righteous, and it was struggling to reflect God's light in the world. They have no wine is not simply a comment by Mary about the panic of the wedding host. It's a theological statement about the Judaism that is now encountering Jesus in Cana. It has run out, run out of wine, run out of purpose, run out of meaning, and yet it does not run to Jesus. Mary, on the other hand, I love Mary. She makes her move. Some actually think that Mary was involved in the catering of the wedding, responsible for the food. But regardless of her role, She's not worried because Jesus is there. DW. This is the first demonstration of his power publicly, but she raised Jesus. She saw some interesting things when he was a child and adolescent and teenager and young adults. She's watched him all these years, so she knows what he can do. So she turns to him and she says, they have no wine. Let's go. No wine. Do it. But Jesus doesn't solve the problem immediately. It must have been frustrating for Mary. Can you imagine? Jesus is your son. And you know what Jesus can do and believe that he can do what needs to be done, but your request falls on deaf ears. In verse 4, Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Jesus, little face to eh? A little face to you, Jesus. It sounds kind of rude. It's not exactly as pleasant as some preachers will make it because we want to cover up for everything God does, but we need to just get out the way and let God do what he does. It's kind of rude, but the Greek word for woman is a term of, of respect and endearment. John later presents Jesus addressing his mother as woman. One more time in the gospel, you know when that is? It's while he's hanging on the cross. The only two instances where Jesus is addressed, where Jesus addresses Mary and John with that word woman, are two instances that connect the wedding of Cana to the cross of Calvary. Jesus is not being rude. However, Jesus is being firm. You know, Pastor Millet, without saying too much, right? He had to lead a group of pastors. Men, we're stubborn. All we like sheep have gone astray. Every one of us, we've turned to our own way. And I saw him there as a strong leader, being firm when he needed to be firm. Jesus is firm. He is starting his ministry free of human advice, agenda, or manipulation, even though it's his mother. He wanted his mother to realize that his power and authority were not at her disposal. Just because you've been in the church or served in the church, or are serving in the church, doesn't mean that you can get what you want when you want it from God. 
No, 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 mother. You did a lot for me, and I'm so grateful for what you did for me. But you cannot and will not dictate how I carry out God's purpose in my life. It's not about you. It's not even about the bride and the groom. It's all about the will and glory of God. And yet Jesus proceeds and concedes to his mother's request. God finds a way to help us even when our motives do not match his mission. It would be easy just to walk away. I'm done here. I'm going home. But Jesus concedes and proceeds. Verse 5, his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. That ought to be a mantra in our spiritual lives. Whatever Jesus says, do it. Not what Pastor Feely says, but, but whatever the Word says, whatever Jesus says, do it. Mary, considered by some to be divine and elevated above Jesus, the intercessor between Jesus and the Father, is telling them not to do what she says, but to do whatever Jesus says. Verse 6, now there were six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jewish cleansing rituals often involved large amounts of water because there was a fear of constant defilement and contact with the world. So worshipers poured over their hands and utensils this ritual water to make themselves ritually clean for religious services and events. Stone pots, as opposed to clay pots, were often used to protect against ritual contamination. Each stone pot held 20 to 30 gallons. In total, the six pots, therefore, held about 120 or 180 gallons of water for purification. Jesus produced an enormous amount of wine. Enough for the wedding, and some suggest even enough for the rest of the village. God's blessings overflow and are abundant for the believer. He gives us more than enough, enough to be blessed in our lives, but enough to also bless other lives. In verse 7, Jesus instructed the servants, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He could have done it himself, but he used the servants. He chooses the least and the last and the lost to do his work. And it was obedience to the instructions of Jesus that enabled them to experience the miracle we must be careful to obey the instructions that the Lord has given us. We must live according to the word of God. If we do our part, he will do his part. If we do the ordinary, God will give us the extra to do the extraordinary. They followed the instructions, and the instructions led to innovation. Verses 8 to 10. And he said to them, draw some out now, draw some out now, and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior wine. You have kept the good wine until now. Oh, God saves the best for last. And the results of this story are amazing. Jesus not only produces wine, but he produces good wine, excellent wine, the best wine. 
Keep in mind that this is not a story about whether or not God approves of drinking, so don't get it twisted. Pastor Feely doesn't drink, doesn't touch my lips. You better believe it. That's not what this story is about, whether I'm right or you're right. This story is about what God is doing. It's about God meeting a cultural need and coming to rescue a newly married couple. John's emphasis is not on the fact of it being fermented or unfermented. It's on the quality of the wine and the timing of its arrival. The wine is good. It's sweeter than Krispy Kreme donuts. And the wine served before this wine is inferior. Even the best wine that the couple had to offer is no comparison to the wine that Jesus offered. It's not about works. Yes, faith without works is dead. You've got to have some proof of God's blessing and presence in your life. But we shall be saved by faith through grace, by grace through faith, and not by works. It is the gift of God. It is Jesus showing up and giving you better than you've ever had before. Everything before Jesus was inferior, including Judaism. The six water pots could provide ceremonial purification, but they were incomplete without Christ. Seven is the number of perfection and completeness in the Bible. But one short of seven is six. Six, six, six is the number of something in the book of Revelation. But six plus Jesus equals everything we need. That is the seven we need. Jesus is innovative. He takes what is old and he does something new. He's able to do a new thing in your life and bring you into a new season in your life and bring you some new experiences in your life. He takes the Old Testament and he puts a New Testament spin on it. He takes the Old Covenant and gives us the New Covenant. He doesn't get rid of the commandments or the Sabbath or Judaism. He doesn't get rid of it altogether, but he gives it new meaning, new meaning to the past and new vision for the future. And we should do the same. Albert Einstein said, we can solve our problems. We cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. We cannot expect to change a system using the very same tools, methods, and materials that we use to build it in the first place. Sometimes we have to do new things in the church. I can say that because it's new life. We got to take that old time religion and make it new. It might be good enough for Paul and Silas, as the song says, but maybe it's not good enough for Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17 says, The old has gone, but the new has come. Mark 2 and verse 22, And no one puts new wine into old wineskins or else the new wine bursts the wineskins. The wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined, but new wine must be put into new wineskins. When we are so loyal to what's old, we risk losing what's new. New is scary. New is different. But Jesus is innovative. You've got some homework to do. Study Jesus. Yeah. Study your quarterly. Study the 28 fundamental beliefs. These are good documents. But don't forget to study Jesus. He's in there if you look for it, but just study him. Study the story of Jesus. He was innovative. He didn't put new wine in new wineskins in this story. Instead, he turns water into wine using some stone pots. 
Judaism is the water and Christianity is the wine and the purpose of the wine is to be a blessing. It is poured out to bless the guests at the wedding. The wine was not for the thirst of the bride or bridegroom. The wine was for the visitors. Everything we do in church should be for our guests so that they feel blessed and welcomed. It's not about us being comfortable or us having our preferences. It's not about our opinion and us being critical because we didn't like the praise and worship this Sabbath. I didn't see you up there doing praise and worship, so you don't have a right to criticize praise and worship. When you're up there doing praise and worship or preaching the sermon, you have a right to criticize the sermon and the praise and worship. Everything we do should be for the guest. Every Sabbath should be an evangelistic series where people see Jesus lifted up so that all men could be drawn unto him. Everyone should be blessed and everyone should be welcomed. And I believe God is doing something in our church, but if we will continue to grow this church and take it to the next level, we must be fresh and new. And we must be poured out like the wine. Sometimes we're a little too full. Too full of pride, too full of success, too full of ourselves. We need to be poured out like a drink offering. We need to humble ourselves. They were using these vessels to wash themselves of uncleanness. They were using these vessels not to drink, but then they put the wine in these vessels and used them to drink. It tells us what God can do with any type of vessel, but it tells us that we must be willing to let God work as he sees fit. There's a lot of things in my job description. I got it one year. I had already started pastoring, and I made a mistake. Because then I got the job description a few years later, and I said, man, that's a lot of stuff. (laughs) But there's a lot of stuff that's not in that job description that I do and a lot of pastors do, and I'm sure Cyril Millett did at the ministerial summit, Because it's the only way it will get done. There's a lot of members who don't even have a job description. Or a ministry description. And yet they do what they do because it's the only way that it will get done. Only then will the guests of the wedding be blessed and the mission of God fulfilled, and you are equipped to be a blessing. You are empowered to be a blessing. Jesus tells the servants to draw some out now. What's interesting is that the word draw refers to drawing water from a well. Not from a water cooler, from a well. That's the only way the Greek word is used for draw in the New Testament. Typically, a well is constantly replenished through various factors. And there were six 20-gallon water pots of wine. There was 120 gallons of wine. That's impressive. But what's even more impressive is that the wine was being replenished. God not only provides, he sustains, he restores, and he replenishes. A well is a hole dug deep enough that it penetrates below the water table, and therefore it fills up with water when it is emptied of water. Can you imagine? These pots, they're drawing from the pots. They're drawing from the pots. And they're watching as they are being replenished because they see that these pots are under the power of Christ. God's power is not just to deliver you in that moment. God's power is to replenish you and to satisfy you and to give you the strength you need to move forward from that moment. In reference to the wedding of Cana, Desire of Ages, page 148, says this, He gives grace for grace. She's speaking about 
the wedding at Cana, and she says, there can be no failure of supply. John describes this phenomenon as a sign. Verse 11, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed him. What Jesus did was not a miracle, it was a sign. Gary M. Berger explains, a miracle underscores power and is generally received with awe. A sign is revelatory, disclosing something from God, something hidden before. It wasn't a miracle, it was a sign. It sounds confusing, maybe semantics, but God is not primarily focused on performing just supernatural things in your life. God is focused on revelation in your life. Revelation about who he is and who you are and who you are meant to be. Did you notice that the first sign, the water into wine, was semi-public? Only the servants and disciples gained knowledge of the source of wine. Only they could see that Jesus was the one who performed the sign. No one else witnessed Jesus' works. They were the only ones who saw the fruit of his labor. Sometimes Jesus works behind the scenes in your life. Not every story is for Wednesday night prayer meeting testimony. Not every story needs to be told on Facebook or Instagram. Not everyone will understand what happens in your life. But as long as you let Jesus work behind the scenes in your life, as long as you be still and know God in your life, you will be blessed. And it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. You will be blessed and others will be blessed as well. We've examined the invitation, the inquiry, the instruction, the innovation. And now we finish here. The implication. What does it all mean? Is this a lesson between fermented and unfermented wine? What does it all mean? Why did Jesus go to Cana? You know, I have to be honest with you. The Scarborough in me, at first I thought it was spite. Jesus went to Cana because Nathaniel said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Jesus said, I'm about to show you what comes out of Nazareth. It was an opportunity for Jesus to flex his Messiah muscles in the presence of Nathaniel in Nathaniel's hometown. But God is not spiteful like that. He's just, but he's not spiteful. He's not trying to make Nathaniel embarrassed. He's trying to make Nathaniel a believer. And according to verse 11, he succeeded because the disciples present believed and they now had fuel they had fuel to go forth equipped to do god's work so why did he go to affirm the sanctity of marriage that's another reason we give he did his miracle at the wedding of cana because it was a wedding and he was affirming the sanctity of marriage and certainly there is a lot of truth there he used, think about it, his creative powers, Garden of Eden, to recreate and save a marriage that had just started. Wouldn't it be a shame that after you, your wedding takes place, all of a sudden, you're in danger of separating? The wedding at Cana takes us back to creation, and it also takes us forward to the second coming of Jesus, the second coming of our Lord. When the Jews reflected on what heaven and the arrival of the Messiah would be like, they thought about banquets and parties and celebrations. And the wedding banquet most certainly came to mind. Jesus affirmed marriage and announced his coming at the wedding of Cana. Revelation 19, 7 and 9 describes the second coming of Christ as the marriage supper of the Lamb. And you know, while this is a crucial point, the sanctity of marriage, clear in Scripture, I don't think it's the main reason. After all, if you read the passage, it makes no direct reference to creation, 
or the second coming of Jesus. What about the name Cana, the wedding of Cana? The name Cana is translated ownership or possession. Even though Jesus was from Nazareth, the people of Cana became his own. He already made an impression. That's why he was invited. God claims all kinds of people. That's a message for us today. God claims us from different walks of life. Isaiah 56 and verse 7 says, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. And that's a good point. And all of those stand out to me. And all of those intersect at the wedding of Cain. But one thing is primary today. DW. 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 Don't worry, says Jesus. I got this. Rachel Held Evans again says, we have a hard time believing that God cares about our routine realities. That God's glory resides in the stuff of everyday life. Just waiting to be seen. God notices what the guests do not notice. And God can work through your disappointment and your shame and your embarrassment and your regret and your remorse to bring about good. What seems like a painful situation can actually become a doorway to promise in your life. God can take our experiences from the bottom to the top, from death to life, heard it at the summit this week a cocoon is the tomb of the caterpillar tomb of the caterpillar but the womb of the butterfly you might feel today like you're in the tomb and you may not realize that you're in the womb that God through the dying of one experience is birthing another experience that God through the dying of one season is birthing another season. And let's not forget that God was willing to die so that we could have his wine, his blood poured out so that we could live. I stopped by here today to say DW, don't worry about what's going on in your life. Don't worry about the season in your life. Don't worry about the sickness in your life. Don't worry about what's running out. Run to him. God's got this. Obey him. Trust him. Give him your empty vessel. Watch him turn it into a well. Let the miracle happen. Let the stale water of your life turn into new wine. Today I'm speaking to you. And I want to encourage you. Because we all need encouragement. Pastors need encouragement. We need summits. We need things to recharge and refresh and renew. We need God to work miracles for us too. Sometimes we're in the tomb and we need to transition to the womb. And I know you might feel the same today. You might be feeling stressed, worried, ashamed, embarrassed. You might feel like you're running out. I'd like to pray for you today. That God would come to your crisis, to your wedding, to your situation, and give you exactly what you need work with you and your request. See, I believe Mary thought that, you know, he would just magically perform something out of midair and water would appear. But Jesus was not operating according to her agenda. And he did something different and innovative that no one could see coming. He can do that for you. He can do that for your church. He can do that for your family. He can do that for your marriage. DW. 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 So I want to encourage you today. The worship.
team is going to lead us in a song. And I'd like to pray for you once they're done. If you need God to show up in your life right now, you need the tomb to become a womb. You need victory where there seems like there's defeat. You've tried everything you can, but you need God to step in. I want to pray for you today. I want to pray for you today. So while they sing, I invite you to come forward, and I'm going to pray for you at the end of the song. blessed as we finished our worship together. It's a message for me as well to know that God is able to do the unexpected in my life. That God has a plan for each and every one of us. And I want to encourage you, no matter what you're facing, just know that He will never fail you. DW, DW, He will never fail you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for how you started your ministry with 
that powerful sign, and we see the signs throughout the Gospel of John. You manifested your, your power and your purpose, Lord. You did something that no one could ever expect. And God, we, help, we ask that you would do the same in our lives. That whatever is dead, you would bring it to life. That whatever is lost, that it will be found. God, that you would work for us on the third day. May we experience the third day, God. When miracles happen. When the tomb is broken. When the water turns into wine. Help us, Lord. Each person's come forward today with unique needs. But in a way, we all just need Jesus, and we pray for your miracle in each life. We pray for healing. We pray for deliverance. We pray for your salvation. We pray, dear Lord, for our church. May we be a bright light in this world, not self-sufficient like the people of Cana or the people of Judaism, but that, Lord, we would see Jesus and know Jesus and show Jesus to the world. May we be poured out in this ministry, but may we also be replenished, God. May you do for us and through us what only you can do. And may we forever hear that slang term, that acronym, DW. DW, DW, don't worry. Don't worry. I got this. Lord, we're claiming that today. That the same way you came through in Cana, you're going to come through in Oshawa. You're going to come through in Ajax. You're going to come through in Whitby. You're going to come through in different parts of the GTA because we claim it. In Jesus' name, let everyone say amen. Amen. You may be seated. Here's why, because he's able.
Thanks for tuning in for that message. I pray it was a blessing to you. You know, at New Life, we exist to love God and to love people. We believe in serving the Oshawa community and surrounding communities, and we believe in serving you. If there's ever a time where you want to give back and support our ministry, we would encourage you to give in three ways. You can visit our website and you can look at the giving tab. You can give through Interact Transfer, e-transfer, and you can also mail us a check. Most of all, we want to encourage you to be blessed by our contents, to subscribe to our channel and to like our videos as we continue to share with you the Word of God. Until next time, God bless.